Welcome everybody. Nice to see some uh, familiar faces and some uh, unfamiliar faces who I hope we uh, stay in touch and have a good time. Um, uh, the meeting is being recorded, so if you don't want to do anything incriminating, uh, keep yourself on mute with your camera off. Um, and so we've got uh, Doug Mazinski with us as well with Scott. Doug is a dear friend. Um, we've been uh, playing with feedback and form tree with his work for a few years now with his awesome private practice, Gippsland Adventure Therapy. Um, and just a shameless plug for Doug, he runs an awesome outdoor therapy support group. Um, and he's very nervous and doesn't like the limelight, but it's a really great um, place to be, especially for those in Australia um, to support their practice um, as well. Um, so, um, that's your job, Doug. <laughs> um, so I'm joined here today. You can see that I, I've worn the adventure therapy outfit today. Um, which is to wear plaid, and um, joined with uh, Scott Miller. Um, Scott, nice to see you. Good to see you, Will. Hello to everybody. Glad to be part of this presentation. Yeah, and so part of the, the context of what we're doing is um, uh, we're working on this study of adventure therapy and using feedback-informed treatment, which is Scott's uh, side of work. Um, and uh, um, I've been lucky enough to have uh, mentoring, kind of informal supervision and coaching from Scott um, for the past uh, probably about 10 years, Scott, I'd say. And I've been able to come do some trainings with you in Chicago. And so it's uh, really nice to always uh, present with you and, uh, and to get um, a, a grant from University of Washington Bothell to um, give this training for free to everyone is really nice. Yeah, well, it's a, again, as I say, it's been a pleasure interacting with you over these many years and to see how you're integrating feedback-informed treatment into adventure therapy work. And I'm just looking at this picture of myself. I sort of look mad or something. I don't know. That's probably because I'm outdoors, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm just not really an adventure therapist myself, mostly a psychologist who sits in a room with one or maybe sometimes a, a family of folks doing psychotherapy. So I've learned a lot from my interaction over those many years working together with you, Will. Yeah, thank you. And and the fact, as I've said many times, it's remarkable that we've convinced you to give a shit about us outdoorsy types. Um, <laughs> so much now about this feedback informed treatment um, that I use for. Okay, doke. So for today, um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about living in evidence-based times, and we're going to talk about using fit as a the this uh, as a tool to to catch those and who uh, are falling through the cracks, as we might say, those who might not be engaged in our in what we're delivering, and and those who might not be benefiting, and. Um, we're going to look at strategies for using um, the fit measures to um, uh, to adapt the services we provide. As out as many of us are outdoorsy people, we're used to adapting to the wild environment. Um, we just spent ten minutes talking about snakes and huge wasps and alligators in Florida, and so we're we're used to adapting to that. And we're also going to look at how do we adapt the therapy side to the adventures that we take our um, our clients on. So I want to pass over to uh, you, Scott, as the uh, the sort of guru of uh, knowing about, like uh, unpacking and deconstructing this uh, living in evidence-based times. Okay. Thanks, Will. We, we do, of course. I'm not saying anything that people on the call are unfamiliar with when I say we do live in evidence-based times, whether that's how we approach the pandemic or what gets paid for when providing mental health care services worldwide, wherever I go, people want to know what the evidence says. And that's sort of been my calling card for the last 35 years of my career. I have no treatment model or approach to sell people. Instead, what my team and I have done for that period of time is simply look over the research evidence with the question, what can we learn here about how to be more effective as clinicians? And 
you can trace these efforts all the way back to the 1960s. And when in the 1960s, uh, the number of psychotherapy models range from around 60 different approaches. And nowadays, in 2023, we have over a thousand different treatment approaches available, at least the last time that these were counted. Some say it's even more. There are so many of these approaches that organizers and reviewers have decided to just break them into classes and they they're broken into two to eight classes. When I went to graduate school, we had Raymond Corsini's single volume called Current Psychotherapies. It was about 300 pages. Now you have a volume, uh, uh, actually, Kasdan, I believe it's Kasdan, this volume is, uh, is four different double column, 900 page uh, mm -hmm. massive books uh, reviewing the different treatment approaches. Did a little search just a couple of years ago, looking for how many books on psychotherapy are actually in print. And at that time, it was over 55,000 books. And sometimes I jokingly say when I teach workshops to people who sit in a room with their clients rather than getting out of the room, I say any field that needs 55,000 books to tell them how to do this certainly doesn't know what it's doing. We just have a whole lot of resources at our disposal, so much so that it can be pretty overwhelming. Go to Division 12's website of the American Psychological Association, and they list 80 evidence-based psychological treatments. That is treatment protocols for 27 of the 157 official diagnoses in the DSM-5. So we 27 out of the 157, chances are your probably treating one of uh, the other 130 diagnoses for which some evidence-based protocol hasn't yet been identified. For me, it means it's going to be really hard to keep up with the various trends in the field. And if you go back and ask yourself what started all of this, well, it really can be dated back to this guy in the picture whose name was Hans Eysenck, a bit of a gadfly in the field and in 1950. Well, it says 52. I guess that must have been the year. I was thinking 55, but I think that was his response to all the criticism that came out after his review study was published. 24 studies of psychotherapy that he looked at, and his conclusion was the results failed to support the hypothesis that psychotherapy facilitates recovery. In fact, in that review article, he claimed that going to see a psychotherapist was actually associated with poorer outcomes than no treatment at all, 1952. That caused a huge development in our field. People became interested in outcome research for the very first time. And we can successfully say that in 2023, matters are really quite different. The data is, in fact, overwhelming that therapy works, so much so that about a decade ago, the American Psychological Association published a review uh, that of nearly 60 years, thousands of studies, and here's the exact quote from that particular review. The best research evidence conclusively shows that individual group and couple and family psychotherapy are effective for a broad range of disorders, symptoms, and problems with children, adolescents, adults, uh, and older adults. And that data also said it really didn't matter which particular approach that was used. In fact, I'll make a bold claim here, in no study of a bona fide psychological treatment, what I mean is one that's intended to be therapeutic and for which there's a manual, none has been shown not to work. Now, that's an interesting thing to think about, uh, and we'll come back to that uh, a bit shortly. So therapy works. There's absolutely no questions. Hans Eysenck had it wrong. Uh, and researchers have filled in in the interim telling us about all the various ways that we might help folks. That's the good news. There's also some bad news. And the bad news is this, that 50 years of research has not shown any improvement in the outcome or methods for engaging people. And this 2,000 pound figure that you see splattered across the screen is because of a wonderful project that was undertaken in the UK 
to help improve access to psychological treatments. That was called the IAPT program. And in, up until about 2008, 2009, I think they spent a billion pounds trying to get people into psychological care. And that data, that data indicated, in fact, that, that they could expand services usefully each year of that particular project where they were investing money and trying to get people into care, the, the access actually improved. And having people see real-world therapists, this is a critical distinction, seeing a real-world therapist, not in a laboratory study where the treaters have all the advantages real-world practitioners don't. For example, in a real-world clinical setting, you have to take all comers, not just people with the diagnosis of interest. And you have to provide services sometimes under very challenging and difficult circumstances. No access to good quality consultation or supervision, low amounts of training. You're basically doing it on your own. And when they ran this study, they found that recovery rates were equivalent with those tightly controlled randomized clinical trials. So worldwide, our own data monitoring therapists around the world, as well as the IAPT program, which by the way, now spent another billion uh, pounds helping improve access, shows that the treatment absolutely, ab absolutely works. But that two billion pound investment Still, 85% of those with mental health issues don't get treatment. So that's pretty amazing. In other words, we're helping about 15% of the people who are suffering. And perhaps a bit more damning of our work, 56% of clients did not engage or discontinued after a single visit. Now, as a field, we've known that the modal number of treatment visits to an outpatient therapist dating all the way back to the mid forties is one, and it's always been one. And IAPT, despite its significant investment, really didn't change that. Still people dropped out en masse, and why? Of course, the minute the studies began to be published, there was a lot of debate and the usual suspects were marched out. This must be because there's still stigma. This must be the cost of treatment. Ah, people don't have insurance. There's no access to service. Ah, the, the people that need the service the most are in denial or simply ignorant. But that's a pretty ar hard argument to make if you actually look at the IAP study because it couldn't have been the cost of treatment that caused 56% of the people to drop out. Why? Services were free. People didn't have to pay a, a one penny in order to see the therapist. The issue wasn't access because people were offered uh, services. They were driven to the services and they still dropped out. The issue isn't ignorance. In fact, in the United States, 80% of people who are asked know that psychological care exists. At the same time, what they question is really the outcome of that service. So stigma, this is always one that is on the top of the hit parade in terms of reasons people don't come to service. I, I, I was at a conference, two, let's see, a one month ago actually, where it was argued that stigma was a primary barrier to treatment, and it is for some. But in fact, in the latest research, only 3% of people surveyed who decided not to see a therapist cited stigma as a major concern. So that just doesn't seem to be the reason why people are dropping out of mental health care. And for the last, I would say, 50 years when we've tried to understand this problem, my view has been that we've been looking at this one way. We've been looking through, let's just speak, in a metaphor here, through the keyhole of the psychotherapist's office. And in there, we see one therapist working with one client. This is the traditional way I've worked for the last 35 years. And I guess the idea might be that maybe that just doesn't fit everybody. Now, let's take a moment and a breath and just review. The data say overwhelming that psychotherapy works, but outcomes have not improved in nearly 50 years 
And despite the invention of thousands of different treatment approaches, people still aren't engaged beyond a single session in most instances. So maybe the time has come, and this is what happened when I first met Will and his group, to, to turn things around and to look out of the keyhole rather than through the keyhole, to look for more ways to engage people instead of in a chair in a therapist's office. Will? Yeah, and, and, and we have similar uh, turf battles in our field under this umbrella of adventure therapy, outdoor therapy, you know, we've got nature-based therapy, surf therapy, horticulture therapy, um, outdoor behavioral health care, wilderness adventure therapy, wilderness therapy, that list goes on as well. And, and sometimes when, we, when uh, I think of the term adventure therapy, which we put um, in the front of our study, and we, um, many of us are used to that term, it really is kind of just a word that's a really nice big tent for all of us to join under. And then we don't really have to work the same or agree to work the same um, to use that term. And I think one of the lovely things I learned from Scott and I wanted to just share um, share this is that when I met Scott, I, I felt very comfortable. Uh, I was working in wilderness therapy. I felt very comfortable being outside for long periods of time, sitting with clients for long periods of time, having, um, I thought I was pretty skilled at um, engaging with youth. And when any, whenever anybody asked me how it works, I couldn't answer it. I couldn't answer it as a social worker. I wasn't good at understanding the neuroscience that was gaining in popularity. And I took um, meeting Scott really changed the way I think about what we're doing when we're talking about adventure and the outdoors is we know from the data, what we find is the people, well, Scott, I wanna ask you this. Hmm. What, what does the data say about who doesn't come back after one session? Well, generally single session dropouts, and there's lots of reasons. There are external barriers, for example, childcare has, has, is a perennial problem. Uh, access to services, being able to pay for parking when you have to go in a city like mine, Chicago, drive into the town and pay 30 bucks, taking time off work, et cetera. But I think all of these miss the point really, because we have known since David Orlinsky's pioneering work in the field of psychotherapy outcome research dating back all the way to the 80s, the, that the equation for outcome is quite simple. The number one process related predictor, and let's tie that to our dropout rates in psychotherapy, number one process related predictor of outcome is engagement, the client's engagement. The more engaged they are, the better the outcome is. The question is what predicts that engagement? And believe it or not, it's not a focus on our thinking, on our behaving, on our emotions. It's not whether you conduct the therapy indoors or outdoors. It's this relationship between the provider and the client that they serve, sometimes in the literature called the working alliance. So engagement predicts outcome, Alliance predicts engagement. And here, interestingly enough, it's not the helper's view of that alliance. Oh, do we have a good working relationship? In fact, historically, the correlation between how helpers view the alliance and the outcome is pretty low on the order of about 0.3 in terms of a correlation coefficient. But if you look at the client's view of the relationship, which is where I think you were going with your question, this mm -hmm. is the big predictor. If you have an alliance issue in the beginning, this is highly correlated with clients not returning for second and subsequent visits. And by the way, just because some of the people that you work with, Will, I know will be taking clients away from their homes and into the wilderness, it's not just drop out physically that we're talking about here, but drop out in every other way, mentally, emotionally, behaviorally, people can be gone from the clinical work that you're doing in so many different ways. So the question is, is how can we improve the alliance with our clients that leads to engagement and then improves outcome? Absolutely. And so part of 
we're, we're looking at what, what predicts the outcome of improving the, the client's well-being, improving what they what they want to have get better. And then also, what is the alliance? What, what are we looking at? And so Scott, for many years, has used this uh, analogy of a three-legged stool, which I, I always thought was funny because stew is also poo-poo. And, um, and I thought, sitting still, sitting down is not really the way most of us like to work. And so my friend uh, who's in the chat, Stefan Natanchuk in the UK, we got together and uh, I bought a carton of beer from my friend who's a cartoonist. And I said, what is something else that has three things that are necessary? And many rock climbers will know we often talk about having three points of contact. And the three points of contact that I really like are, do we actually know what the client, do we have contact with how the client is viewing these three things? And so um, when we have those three points of contact, we can move forward. And so climbing is a nice metaphor. Um, lead climbing is a nice metaphor. The client's leading the climb. We just went full metaphor on this one. Um, and so the relation, it starts with the relational bond. And again, this is not how the, the practitioner sees that relational bond. It's um, the, the joke is sort of, I can't get home from a session with a client and, and, and tell my family, you, you all should have seen how empathetic I was this afternoon. It was remarkable. Um, it is how the client views that. Um, the client goes home and says, well, you know, Will, Doug was really tuned in with me today. Um, it really felt like we were really connected. Um, we also want some sort of consensus about the purpose of our relationship. Are we working on similar goals? And and granted, as, as Scott said, there's a lot of times we work uh, far away with young people who, who may even be um, not really too thrilled about going on an adventure with us. That still doesn't mean we can't have, we skip having some sort of consensus about the purpose of our work. That's another way someone will psychologically check out. They'll they'll play the games with you, they'll paddle the canoe, but the alliance is ruptured when there's no agreement on the purpose of our work. And then the, the means of our work is what we're doing. Are we doing some, the activities that we use, are they finding meaning in all of this? And probably most importantly, and this is the top of the the stool um, in the stool analogy is the client preferences, their cultural background. And remember, therapy is inherently a cultural endeavor. Um, and so um, we want to, to have ideas about how the client wants to be seen. Um, all the what we call extra therapeutic factors um, as well. Is there anything to add to our uh, little drawing here, Scott? And by the way, let me tell you, I asked um, our, our dear friend Daniel about this drawing. I sent it to Doug and I sent it to Stefan. And the only things they focused on were the knots that were tied. They they thought like therapists, just uh, we need more gear, better carabiners, better illustration of the knots. Um, it was so funny. I said, it's just a metaphor and it's a cartoon. Um, <laughs> and anything else to add about the Alliance, Scott? Let me just provide a bit of historical context. Uh, if engagement is the number one, if client participation is the number one predictor of engagement, uh, then the, the question for us was how could we keep people engaged? And since we were sitting around, as you said, we thought of the stool with the three legs. Agreement on goals, agreement on the means or methods, agreement on that relational bond as the client experience us as warm, empathic, genuine, and respectful. And then what held it all together and provided a bit of a cushion were the client's preferences Preference. in two kinds. Kind. One were instrumental preferences. Here's where your work, I think, may fit really snugly. And then identity preferences. Let me talk about the latter first. Identity preferences are how do I want to be seen by the helpers? Who am I? And how do I want them to see me? The second one are these instrumental preferences, which are usually easier to accommodate. One of them might be, do we have to sit here in this office all the time and talk? Can't we be on top of a surfboard and do therapy, et cetera? When those kinds of preferences are accommodated, clients sit comfortably into the three-legged stool or in your cartoon drawing, they're able to reach that next piece to climb up. And 
here the idea again is simply forming that working relationship or alliance between the helper and the client. And that's where when we get to this bottom bullet point, we the research is 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 pretty clear that um, the helper uh, and the practitioner were not necessarily always that great at knowing when there's ruptures to this alliance. And and we can think about this from the the power side too, that it is uh, the the practitioner is in the position of power and it can be quite awkward to tell them, no, I don't really want to work on that. Now with teenagers, they will tell you all the time what they don't want to do. Um, and we lean into that. Um, and so we want a way, a tool for evaluating how the how the client is experiencing the adventures that we're on and experiencing our work together based on these three things. And this brings us to um, feedback informed treatment. And for, for years when I met Scott and I was uh, stalking him and um, sliding into his DMs and getting all this information from him, um, going to trainings, I would send Scott pictures from our expeditions of trying to win the, the championship of the most beautiful fit administration of the measures that's ever occurred. So this was a good one, sitting at the beach with a client at the end of an expedition. Um, but so, um, Scott, do you want to talk about this this definition and um, and uh, some of the ideas that I've uh, highlighted in here? Sure. So feedback informed treatment emerged out of the research findings, I hope are clear now. One of them is, is that the particular method and location of treatment in general really doesn't contribute to outcomes all that much. What does seem to contribute is the client's experience of the relationship. And so early on, we started monitoring that relationship, the quality of it from the client's point of view. And when I first started, I was using a 10 item measure called the session rating scale that had been developed by a professor and mentor of mine, Lynn Johnson. We were also quite knowledgeable about research, which indicated that if a particular pairing of client and therapist within a given location, let me say this again, if a particular pairing of client and therapist in a given location were going to be helpful to a specific client, the data indicated that improvement should begin to occur sooner rather than later. How, how soon? Within five to six visits. This was a big and sharp contrast from the, what I was trained to think and believe as a graduate student back in the back in the early 80s. And that was the change frequently took a very, very long time. In fact, the research literature said exactly the opposite. The longer it took a therapist working with a client for that client to experience a change, the greater the likelihood that that client dropped out and B, if they didn't drop out, didn't experience a benefit. Let me give you one more finding. No change by the 10th visit, 90% chance that regardless of how many additional visits you add, that there would be a benefit by the last visit other than having had a good relationship. In other words, the client's distress or well-being and functioning hadn't improved. So the other thing we added to the equation was a measurement of the results. Did the client feel like there was progress being made? That particular scale that we started with was the OQ45. That meant that every session in an outpatient setting that I was working in at the time, we gave a tool that had 45 items on it. Unfortunately, many of our clients had difficulty reading and comprehending those items. And so over the years, we developed two simple tools. The SRS, which was an abbreviated version of Lynn Johnson's scale. It's on the right-hand side of this slide. And it measured the qualities of the relationship that uh, uh, Will's cartoon showed relationship goals and topics, approach and method. And we shortened the OQ45 into four items that measured simply the domains that the OQ said it loaded on. How was the individual person's well-being? 
How were they doing in their close interpersonal relationships? Socially, work, school, friendships outside the home and intimate relationships, how are they doing in that particular area? And then one last overall catch-all item that's just labeled overall. Is it is it their general sense of well-being? The scales are visual analog measures. They Clients are instructed to rate how they've been doing in the last week or since their last visit, going from left to right, low scores to high scores. And, and one of the hardest things you will do if you're using the paper measures is to print them and get the lines to be 10 centimeters. So I have mine saved ORS, print at 84%. And I can see Doug nodding as well. And one of the things in, in the past few years of playing with this in the outdoors is, you know, you can print one of these, get it right and laminate it and have clients use dry erase markers. Um, and uh, we can we can administer this um, uh, verbally or experientially. I know Doug talked about having a rope with 10 knots on it and having the client be able to place a carabiner along. And there's ways to do this in different ways. Um, um, and there yeah, are- I'm just, seeing, I'm just seeing a note here from Sandra, Sandra Henry saying, is there no, are there no electronic options? If you happen to have access to cell phone service, yes, there are three systems that not only will administer these measures in about 40 different languages, but score them and plot them against normed trajectories. And you can find those systems listed on my website uh, at scottdmiller.com. So yes, there are electronic solutions uh, to these particular forms. I want you to know that's not the way we started. So we had outreach projects, for example, at the small free clinic I ran for years in the city of Chicago. We were working largely with homeless people, and I wasn't going to take my uh, iPad or cell phone into those contexts. So instead, I had miniature versions of the scales, just the just the items, and I would point to them and have people uh, on laminated copies mark using a grease pen. Mm -hmm. So, perfect. Yeah, and so really, all the all the client does is is put so at the start of if we're thinking therapy classic one hour session, we'd start with this outcome rating scale. Um, and we'd ask the client to plot down um, a rating sort of based on what's bringing them to uh, therapy. Many of us that work with youth um, or, or those who are uh, might be considered an involuntary client, it takes a uh, good amount of practice to really work on how we administer these things. So the paper or the internet doesn't, um, um, doesn't uh, do the magic for you. Um, and so it's it's really in the administration of it. And so and then when we end the one hour session, we would go to um, the session rating scale and and ask the client, how was the session? And our mutual colleague, Daryl Chow in Fremantle, uh, Western Australia, <clears throat> we want to administer this in a way that we seek to be disconfirmed. We want we don't want perfect scores here because there is no perfect session. And so um, anything to add about the sort of administration of that, Scott? I, I would say that uh, here I'm simply looking for feedback. I like that idea of being disconfirmed, actually, Will, that I want to know, especially when the client feels like they're not making progress and when there are issues in how we're relating with one another. Have I misunderstood what's important to them? Have I miscommunicated about who they are as a person? Does my approach or method not fit with them? And the way you score them, if you're working paper and pencil, is you these lines should be 10 centimeters in length, as you mentioned. You're gonna score in centimeters to the nearest millimeter, add the four lines together. You can download the measures from my website for free. There's a little graph that comes along with them that you can plot the scores over time. Now, I did see one question come up about, can you put these into Google Docs? And the answer is no. It's paper and pencil are one of the authorized systems, but digitalization of the scales outside of those systems is, isn't, isn't permitted. That has mostly to do with the 
with the algorithms that are used to interpret this data. When you're using one of the electronic system, client scores are gonna be plotted against an expected treatment response, what we call the ETR. And it will literally show you whether the client is changing in a way that is consistent with people who end the service with you successfully. And it will show you the opposite as well, that your clients are changing in a way that is predictive of a negative result at the end of care. So uh, you want to work to create a culture of feedback around the scales as well. And if there's one area that I find that is the biggest struggle in the beginning, it's confusing the scale with something important. It's just a tool. And this particular tool is designed to get the client speaking up and speaking back to me. So usually what I say, for example, when I'm giving clients the SRS is I say, you know, I work in a slightly different way than you may be accustomed to. Most of the clients that I see and have seen over the course of my career are, uh, I have, this isn't their first rodeo. The second thing I say is that, you know, if I'm going to be helpful, then uh, then generally I need to know that you're getting what you need and what you want from the services. And then, as you said, Will, I always tell people I'm really not interested in perfect scores. If you go to a tailor or you're going to have a brand new pair of boots fitted to you, it doesn't matter if the salesperson thinks they're stylish or look great on you or they fit your outfit. What matters is do they provide comfort and support for your foot? And only you can tell me because it's your foot in the boot. So your feedback is critical to our success and anything and everything. I won't take it personally, but I will take it seriously and we'll try to figure out how I can make a change in the work that we're doing. And some of the initial sort of research we're doing around implementing this in adventure therapy um, is really fascinating in how people are figuring out how to do this in their practice context, whether it's with youth on expedition um, or surf, surf therapy type stuff uh, with young people living with disabilities. It's been a remarkable journey. And there's all different contexts that we work. I see Emma's question about is it is there a, a child's measure absolutely the wording is just a tiny bit different and when you when you download the measures um you'll get some idea about how to interpret score based on people's age um, and i'll just add here uh will yeah. that the adult versions which are from 13 and older are at about the sixth grade 11 and 12 year old reading level the child version is at the second grade or about seven to nine years old uh, age range. There's also a young child version if you're working with really young kids that's not a scorable version. It's really just a structured conversational tool. Yeah. And so, um, and, and, and um, for more context as well, there's a group session rating scale, which takes into account um, cohesion among the group. One of the ways I've uh, implemented this on, on expedition is uh, taking each member of the group um, aside on on uh, on the feedback the the ORS SRS day of the expedition, and and going through the session rating scale group session rating scale or going through the group session rating scale sorry with each individual and then the fire having a conversation about all the feedback that we got and what does the group need to work on to um, support each individual's feedback and work with the group themselves. Um, and so that's been um, an absolutely wonderful tool. And uh, one of our colleagues um, running programs in Western Australia, she said, I, I can't believe it's taken me this long to use a session rating scale in my outdoor work. That it You mentioned... Yep, go ahead, Scott. Well, I was going to say, you mentioned something sort of uh, 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 as a side comment that I, I think is important. I hope it's not too much information. You said on your session rating scale day, and in general, in an outpatient setting like the one that I work in, I'm doing this every time I meet with somebody, which is generally once a week. And I give them the outcome rating scale at the beginning of the visit. Why? 
I want to find out, did I help them from last time? I'm going to give them the session rating scale at the end of the visit. Why? Because I want to find out what their experience was of this particular visit. But if you're seeing clients, let's say you're out, and again, I'm, I'm talking out of my hat here, Will, because I don't do adventure therapy. But if you have people off on a two-week, three-week, four-week adventure, you're not going to want to give them the ORS and SRS every day. Uh, they're they're going to be talking about uh, taking some nefarious action uh, uh, with regard to you when you're sleeping, if you do that. Instead, you're going to want to do, you want to administer this no more than once a week. And here's what I'd recommend. It's the same thing we tell people in residential treatment settings, ORS at the beginning of the week, SRS at the end of the week. And that end of the week SRS, you're going to ha have them review every activity and interaction that they've had. And at the beginning of the week, we're looking at what happened the prior week and do they feel like things are uh, improving for them? Yeah. And yeah, it's a it's about figure. Um, like Scott said, when you're on expedition, your client will get measurement fatigue very quick doing paperwork every day. And so you want to give them the chance to experience the program um, and uh, um, and do that. We do have the GSRS in our book, Stefan. I think it's in there because I have all the examination copies. Um, so really, I, I hope that this time together is sort of an invitation to um, not only just do, yeah, don't worry about our study, but um, to also just uh, to bring fit into your work. And it's been... Um, for me, it's been something that once I got comfortable, comfortable is probably the wrong word. Once implementation was settled, um, it was something I, I've never looked back. Um, Scott, can you say something about implementation? W when does this go wrong? <laughs> I think hearing about the measures, what I'm always surprised, and I think this is even more true of the crew, the people, types of helpers that I've met, uh, it, it, through my interactions with you, Will. Uh, generally, therapists hear about this, they download the measures, and they want to start using them. And I, I think that, that that enthusiasm wanes very quickly. And so I think what needs to happen first is some general exploration. What would it mean to us if we began monitoring and measuring our results? How would it change what we do in, in our program? How will we respond to client feedback when they when they when it's given? Here's an interesting stat uh, by a researcher who I admire. His name is Wolfgang Lutz, who's been looking at routine outcome monitoring, what we call FIT, for about the same time period that, that uh, my group has. He found that when therapists get feedback uh, that their therapy is not fitting their client or helping them make progress, four out of 10 times, they don't even talk with the client about the feedback. And I think it's a challenge in some ways to have that meaningful conversation. What does this mean and what can we do? What happens if the kid sitting opposite you across the campfire, I'm having to imagine this will, because mm -hmm. I, 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 I've never actually been at a campfire uh, because I am a therapist who likes to stay indoors. But it, it, and they say, I don't like you and I don't like being outdoors. How are you going to process that if that's what the client is said and is ending the experience an option for them? So taking some time to explore what this means for your intervention, I think, is a critical first step. Mm -hmm. Second one is that we know from implementation science research, I'm not talking about in general, but specific to FIT, that it takes programs about two years to see the results of their efforts at implementing FIT. At first, you're trying to figure out when to do it, with whom to do it, and then next, how to use the feedback to inform care. And our data indicate that it takes a couple of years for therapists to become comfortable with having these conversations. And that's in an environment with lots of support for doing it. There's a good question here, Scott, about group work where there where there might be multiple facilitators. Yeah. Um, and I think that's it, it get it can get messy that way, where it's good to know who the 
who the leader of the group is. So obviously on, on when we're on expedition with our program, I am the leader, despite there being other therapeutic professionals around that I'm the one sort of responsible for outcome. And that yeah. client can say to me, I'd rather work with Doug than you. And that is okay as well, that we're taking that feedback on board and, and um, helping people, we're tailoring that care to them. Is there yeah. any other implication for that, Scott? Well, I, I, I'd be completely honest. I'm not sure I understand the question com completely. Uh, let me just say two things. Uh, the first one is that we often end up thinking that two therapists is twice as good as one. And I'm not sure I be, I'm I'm not sure I believe that uh, mm -hmm. I I I I I don't believe that. So when therapists ever raise this question, for example, in my context, it would be we like to use two group facilitators in in our groups, and I always lean in and say why, and there's never really a good answer other than well this is just the way we work, mm -hmm. and uh, I I don't see any evidence other than twice the cost why you would have well, have two. Now there may be some very real staffing reasons etc why in the in the in at the out of, out of doors therapy context you might want to have more than more than one when you're filling out the srs in a group it's not just about the leaders it's also about the interactions between the group participants so a little trick that i've used is uh, because sometimes even a group context where there are multiple facilitators and lots of of clients you get high scores on the SRS. So what I will do is I'll pass them out around the group and I'll say, fill it out with hardly any instruction. Then I would say, now I want you to think back over the last week, all the interactions, all of the professional interactions and all the interactions you've had with others and think of the one that was the least helpful and re-complete the group session rating scale. Think, think what I've done here. First, they mark it, and oftentimes you end up with kind of a rosy glow rating. Then I've said, now I want you to call back and think of the what, the interaction or the experience that was the least satisfying relation relationship-wise. Mark it again. And then as soon as they mark it low, and if there's a difference, I say, who, what, when, where, and what are we going to do about it? And that way, I can tease out whether it's a poor interaction with me or another group leader, or it's one of the interactions with the other uh, other other people that are on the adventure or in the group, if that makes sense. Yes. And so we um, we have a and and this is sort of this, this is the interesting side note to to what Scott just said is. Many of us talk about experiential learning. Most of our work is founded on this notion of being on an adventure is somehow more experiential than sitting and talking with somebody. But you can use the measures in an experiential way, as Scott just said, to use it as a tool to tease out more information um, about what the client, how the client is, is in fact experiencing the work together. Um, and, in, and in groups, and that does become it does become tricky, Scott, because most of us, most of our adventure activity standards have staff ratios and things like that. Um, but I think it's just important to know who who's the leader responsible for eliciting the feedback um, about that. Um, and so um, I'm just trying to understand Rob's question here. When when a client, if a client consistently is reporting. Um, high numbers um, when acknowledging that we are wanting a real and honest response um, is, is I, I'm, I'm just struggling to understand the question, Rob. Do is it related to the outcome rating scale or the session rating scale? Do you want me to unmute? Go sure. Ahead, Rob. Yeah. Sure. Um, no, the SRS mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm finding some of the the young people supporting just consistently put really high and i'm just aware that in the you know you you regularly say beware of really high scores because is that indicating that they're not really feeling honest they can be honest and real with their answers mm. um, 
Yeah, I can I can tell you just from experience uh, that we haven't found it helpful to try to undo high marks. Instead, spend as much time as you can on your intro to the measure. So. I've all, at least on an outpatient basis, I'm always stopping at about 45 minutes to the after the top of the hour. That gives me five to six minutes to talk about the SRS. And I say those three or four things that I work differently, that I'm really interested in their feedback. I'm not interested in positive scores. They can't hurt my feelings. And then I give the measure. If I still get very high scores, two things to look at. The first is, are the ORS scores going up? Because if the ORS scores are going up, who cares? Because the point is outcome, not process. If the ORS scores or the outcome scale aren't going up or they're variable, then at that particular point, I might point out the outcome scores. It's interesting because you're rating the relationship high but right now, the outcomes really aren't going up. So let me ask you these questions individually, and then I go through them one at a time. Do you really feel like I'm understanding what you're interested in and who you are? Do the, is the way that we're working really a good fit for you? Are there times that you leave and go to your, you leave here and you think, I wish Scott would have asked about this or would say less of that? Then I go back and process, but I'm doing that by connecting the outcome because the point of our work is not to have good relationships. The point of our work is to have great outcomes. The vehicle to getting there is the relationship. So I hope those two things sort of get at a bit of this. Look at the outcome. If they're going up, leave good enough alone. If they're not going up, I point to the outcome and I say, hmm, take a look here. What we're doing together doesn't seem to be changing things for you. Can I ask you a few questions about that? Have you really felt like I under, and then I go through the four questions of the SRS. Yeah, thank you, Scott. That is that is good feedback, good uh, information to take on board. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm i really excited by the amount of people who registered and joined, um, joined today. You know, it's Saturday morning for us, maybe Friday afternoon. Um, it's late and getting late in Europe. Um, but I'm excited when we when we got this uh, study off the ground. And to be clear, it's not really an adventure therapy study. It's a practitioner study about people who are working in the outdoors. We're not trying to prove anything about this work. Um, but we have people um, across a uh, um, across a few continents, which is really exciting for me, and people from all different. Um, doing all types of different work in the field with different populations, um, all different qualifications. And it's been um, just a joy to keep doing this. And that's why I think it's amazing to get more, um, more kind of primer and introduction to this out. And, and having Scott's support has been really um, wonderful with this. And, and it, it, it's uh, easy to download measures. And as Scott said, implementation is slow. And 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 take it slow with new clients and and practice how you introduce it you know introduce it to a friend who is not working in the therapy world and see what feedback they give you i do this with my hockey team all the time i go yeah i just need to practice something i'm thinking of trying something a little bit different and i get them to uh rip me apart and i think about how can i tailor this a little bit differently um but i wanted to sort of conclude with a little bit of a story um some of you, and when, when many of us are in Norway, some of you may have come and seen the, the workshop by uh, Mark, uh, my friend Mark Kartner, who's a police officer. Uh, he couldn't come to Norway, so he recorded his lecture. And good thing is he's really good with a drone. So it was an amazing recording. Um, but as someone who is a troubled teenager myself, I give Mark shit about this all the time. I don't know why I'm engaged in this really awesome professional relationship with the fuzz. Um, but Mark came to me in 2015 and said, I'm starting this program, working with young people. And uh, I've heard and read about you talking about this feedback stuff, and I want to try it. Um, and so Mark and I started working together and looking at all this stuff. We went surfing at conferences, anything to get away from the conference sometimes. 
Um, and Mark's work is pretty amazing. He's working with uh, um, kids with severe disadvantage, lots of trauma. He's had a 20-year career as a child abuse detective in rural, remote northern Queensland. Um, and Mark started playing with feedback-informed treatment. And he just said, this makes too much sense for me, and, uh, and I need to be able to do it. He was so good, his kids give him awards for the experience of a lifetime, um, which was really amazing. And the one thing, Mark's program, it was, it was really fascinating this year. Um, we, we crunched his data over the past few years, and, and he was nominated for an award from the Australian Institute of Criminology for best practices in crime prevention. Wow. This is one person who's working only on his salary, going in and out of schools, working with um, young people, and uh, he's getting his recognition. It's incredible. And he won the award. There he is with his wife. And so that was sort of the good news because feedback, what, what people noticed was here is this guy equipping kids with work ready skills, doing this improving well being, but tailoring and changing his program as he's working with young people throughout the school year. And the outcomes and stories are really amazing. And I just thought it was so incredible The this was the only when we went, I went to this award show with Mark, I was so proud of him. And um, he, uh, th this was the only program that won an award that isn't on a multi-million dollar funded budget. And this was one guy who was using this to make sure what he did worked. He said, growing up as an outdoorsy guy with indigenous heritage, I knew the outdoors would work. But he said, I need to really know who it worked for. And that's why he always says he's never looked back with uh, the feedback informed treatment. And now what was really funny after he won this award, we crunched his numbers from this year and Mark got worse. And the reason he got worse is every kid in the school wanted to go on Mark's program. So it wasn't that his programming was worse. He wasn't really, he, he was getting scores that weren't indicative of being in therapy. And so that means we have more work to do on getting better as we always do. And I love this quote, Royal Robbins is a quote machine about rock climbing, better we raise our skill than lower the climb. And that's what tailoring is really all, all about in this work. Um, and so um, I'm just, it's just been a thrill. Thank you, Doug, for also joining and, and helping with the chat box. But um, it's been a thrill to watch this get implement, implemented across different cultural contexts and to have people ring and call and say, I got this score. What the hell does it mean? What do I need to do next? And that's been uh, really fascinating as well. Um, anything to add about that, Scott? I just say thanks, Will, for this opportunity to support you in opening the, the doors to mental health care and services, moving away from the couch and the chair and into the canoe and the trek. Anything that has increases the chances that we can engage people in thinking about and changing how they feel about themselves, others, and life is a great thing. And I'm happy to have been involved in supporting you in that. One of my favorite quotes from you, Scott, that I don't think you'll remember is, I told you I was crunching my numbers and, and, and looking at some things, and I realized the clients who I have sat in a canoe with had better experience, had better outcomes, not in any rigorous way. And I thought, huh. And you said, why don't you just put the canoe in your office and then you don't have to paddle it if it's all about the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so before we wrap up and everyone can get on with their weekend, um, where to from here? Um, what we're going to do next is, is um, and these will be emailed out for you. And this is something that I think will be so such an opportunity that if you from here, if you if you haven't implemented fit, um, go out and download the measures and get started. Give it a try. If you want to do that with our study, you're more than welcome to. I'd love to help. Um, but what we're going to do is something Scott's been doing for uh, a few years now, these feedback informed treatment cafes. Can you say a bit what th that is? Because the opportunity to offer this to adventure therapy people is uh, really cool. You, you can't anticipate and teach 
all of the challenges that come up when trying to implement FIT. And so what we did starting at the beginning of the pandemic quite by accident was to offer some small groups of support where clinicians in small groups of say 10 could get together and talk about the challenges, talk about the cases, to see what FIT might have to offer, to share experiences with other providers. And they've been, as you said, really popular. So the plan would be to provide space for small groups to chat about and get the support they need implementing FIT in their daily work. So yeah, so we're inviting all of those who have who have you those who have figured out how to print the measures at 10 centimeters are all welcome to join us and talk about their experiences of bringing this to the wild. Hmm. And uh, thank you so much, Scott, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining and your questions. Um, I'll send out the recording. There are this Doug has added the slides. And um, there is also a resources pack with some other materials that might be useful, like uh, Scott's upcoming book, which if you're in the first 100 to pre-order, you get more Scott and Daryl. So um, I've lost you there. Um, oh, there you go. OK, sorry. Um, I've got your question, Jesse, and I'll, and I'll message you about that. Um, Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Scott. And we'll see you all next time. My pleasure. Take care. See you all.